Five. In the barrack house of the guards who guarded Scarenroth Bridge, Scarry set down the two heavy buckets beside the fireplace, then poured them into the cauldron set over the fire. Near him, on the table the gods usually used for their meals, Eoric the surgeon was laying out his saws, scalpels, needles and thread. Meanwhile, old Harn, a peg-legged ex-ironbreaker, who was one of Eoric's usual stretcher carriers, leaned into the fireplace, singeing his long grey beard as he stirred a pot of pitch, which would be used to cauterize any amputated limbs. Very good, lad, said Yorick, nodding to Scarry over the top of his spectacles. Can't wash wounds with just any old water. Got to boil the bad out of it first. He motioned to the door. Fill em up again. Hurry now. Aye, surgeon, said Scarry. But as he picked up the buckets again, a horn blared from outside. He looked up. So did Harn and Yorick. They're here, said Harn. He limped forward, his wooden leg clopping loudly on the flags, and took up a wooden canvas stretcher. Come on, beardling, he called. We'll be wanted soon. My water first, said the surgeon. Scarry grunted with impatience, but took up the buckets again, and ran out the door after the stretcher carrier. As Harn hopped toward the bridge, Scarry dodged through the yard of the barracks house to its well, as all the rest of the dwarves hurried the other way, pulling on their helmets and taking the last bites of their breakfast. Grogni take them, grumbled one. Why don't they wait till I finish my sausage, could they? The first rays of the sun were edging the tops of the mountains that towered all around the bridge in gold, but in the winding pass all was still darkness. The warriors and thunderers made their way to the span by torchlight, the flames glinting off their armor and their weapons. Skari looked at them jealously. He agreed with Auric that he deserved the punishment that had been meted out to him, but he still wanted to be at the front, fighting instead of at the back, carrying away the proudly wounded. As Skari lowered a bucket into the well, the faint sun stepped out of his tent, looking magnificent in a gleaming suit of Gromril armor, and holding the axe Grudgender, which had been in the possession of Clan Burnick for generations in one gauntleted hand. He was surrounded by four of his father's heavily armored hammerers, and paced by the veteran thunderer. When the goblins reach the barricade, Auric told the thunderer, as they started towards the bridge, your lads will fall back and take up new positions in the towers. They won't like that, Fain son, said the thunderer. They're going to want to get stuck in. I know they will, said Auric, but that will be the warrior's job. Your lads will be thinning the ranks behind. If they fail to fall back, I will hold you accountable. Aye, Auric, said the veteran, dejected. They'll do as you bid. They traveled out of earshot as Skari lowered the second bucket. He sighed. He wanted to fight too, but he had about as much chance of that as a goblin had of marrying an elf maiden. Both buckets full, he staggered back into the barrack house, dumped them in the cauldron, then turned to Yorick. Anything else, surgeon? No, no, said Yorick, smiling as he waved him away. Go on, but do as old Horn tells you, mind. Of course, surgeon, said Skari, breathing a sigh of relief. Thank you. He turned and ran out the door. He found Harn in the lee of the left-hand bridge tower, standing beside the stretcher and lighting his pipe unconcernedly, as the last of the dwarf warriors filed onto the bridge and ranked up across it. Are they attacking? Skari asked as he joined him. 
If they were attacking, said Harn, we'd hear it. There was a low wall around the base of the tower. Scarry climbed it, then craned his neck to see down the length of the bridge. He saw murky movement and bobbing torches at the far end, but it was too far away for him to make out any detail. At the near end, the dwarfs were all lined up and waiting. Ten thunderers stood at the front, a shoulder-high barricade erected in front of them that would allow them to steady the barrels of their guns, as well as protect them from goblin arrows. Behind them, Auric and his hammerers stared out across the bridge under Karak Grom's green and silver banner, their helmets on and their visors down. Stout dwarf warriors were lined up to either side of them, and in two ranks behind. Other than a gun crew and a handful of crossbow-armed rangers in each tower, these few were all that faced the six hundred goblins at the far end of the bridge. Scarry turned and looked behind him toward the winding path that led to the hold. He almost hoped the reinforcements would be too late. What a grand and glorious last stand it would be without them. A distant roar made him turn back. Something was happening at the end of the bridge. A large and lumpy shape separated itself from the darkness and lumbered onto the span at an awkward trot. Scarry snarled. It was the troll, the one that had killed Jarl and thrown the cow at him, and it was running right at the dwarves. Scarry was surprised. It was difficult to make a troll do anything, let alone run in a straight line for any distance. They tended to get distracted or forget where they were going. But then he saw two little goblins running after it and poking at its heels with torches. They were driving the thing before them. These really were very clever goblins. A rattle of musket fire echoed off the mountain as the troll came in range of the thunderers. It staggered as the bull spocked it, but then recovered and kept on, roaring angrily. The two goblins capered behind it, shrilling encouragement, and Scarry stared as he realized that they were only the vanguard of a surging tide of goblins that filled the bridge from edge to edge and all the way back to the far side. It was clear that the goblins meant the troll to smash the dwarf's line, and then swarm in amongst them before they could reform. And it might just work. The troll was storming forward of its own volition now. The goblins goading it, the goblins goading no longer needed now that the dwarfs had angered it. The thunderers fired again, and again the monster was put back on its heels, but only for a moment. It recovered and charged on, raising its massive club and howling its defiance. Scarry swore, amazed. The troll had taken at least twenty shots, and it still came on. The vile beast's regenerative powers were terrifyingly swift. Then, above Scarry's head, one of the cannons spoke, belching smoke and flame. The troll flew back in a hail of grapeshot and crashed against the side of the bridge sprawled across the parapet, with its head and torso hanging far out over the black chasm. There were huge holes in its chest and abdomen now, and one of its batwing ears had been shot away. It pawed weakly at the air. That's done it, thought Skari, as the goblin horde hesitated at the sight, and the two torch-wielders shrieked and poked at it. But then, to his amazement, the troll began to rise again, clutching at the rail as the massive wounds in its torso began to knit at the edges. It was unkillable. Then the second cannon fired, spewing more shot, and punched the troll backwards over the rail. Its legs flew up and it was gone, tumbling down into the blackness of the deep ravine. Its handlers shrieked and ran back towards the goblin mob. Yes! cried Skari, punching the air. Fire! bellowed the veteran thunderer. 
his thunderers disappeared in a cloud of smoke as they unloaded into the greenskins. The cannons echoed their volley, spraying more heavy shot down the bridge. Reload! The smoke cleared away on the chill mountain breeze, revealing a score of mangled green corpses and the backs of the goblin horde, as they fled back towards their side of the bridge, squealing in panic. The Thunderers sent another volley after them, dropping another dozen, and they ran even faster. The Dwarfs cheered. Skari hopped down from the wall and slapped old Harn on the back. Aha! Uh -huh, that's seen them off! Oi! Harn said, puffing on his pipe. Or now? Skari snorted. Let them come. If that's the best they can do, we'll hold the bridge forever. Harn glowered at him through his pipe smoke. Never underestimate a goblin beardling, he said. Ask the dwarf who's lost a leg to one. Ah! rasped Dagscar, biting the end of his whip in frustration as his boys ran past him willy-nilly, fleeing the bridge. Now I've lost the troll. Now my plan is busted. He spun to face Nasbud and stabbed a long finger at him. This is all your fault. What did I do now? asked the shaman, folding his arms over his paunch. I didn't do nothing to the troll. It ain't what you did now, it's what you did then. If them stunties hadn't got past your boys, I would a... Oh, leave off about that, snarled Nasbod. I say it's your fault. If your mob moved as fast as my spider riders, we would have beaten the stunties to the bridge. And if your boys would have done their job, we wouldn't have had to rush it, shouted Dagscar. Would you stop bringing up old news, said Nasbod. What are you gonna do now? Dagscar glared at him, and then turned away with a snort and surveyed his forces. What was he going to do? Shifting dwarves out of a fortified position was like trying to push an orc through a rat hole. They just wouldn't go. The squigs would have done it, but the squigs had to be put down. The troll could have done it if it weren't for the stunties' cannons. His eyes fell on the stolen herd of cows, bringing up the rear with the rest of the father. He paused, thinking. They weren't as savage as squigs, but they were heavier and harder to stop once they got moving. But the damn cannons would still turn them into mincemeat before they got halfway across. Unless... He looked at Nasbad's spider riders, hunched on their mounts under the trees at the side of the path. An idea began to grow like a diseased mushroom in his mind. He would have to work fast, before the sun found its way down into the pass. Oi, shaman, he called. Unfurl your ears and listen to me. I got some work for your precious spider boys. Much obliged, lad, said a thunderer, as Scarry filled his mug from the keg he had strapped to his back. Scarry nodded and moved to the next dwarf in line. With the goblins still milling about at the far end of the bridge, the dwarf lines could not retire, so Surgeon Eoric had ordered Skari to bring them hearty ale to keep their strength up. It was humiliating work, serving the dwarves, beside whom he would rather be fighting, but it was necessary, so he did it without complain, though he couldn't bring himself to look any of them in the eye. He had just turned the spigot on the tap to fill the next Thunderer's mug, when a cry rang out behind him. Where the flanks? To the right! Skari turned, spilling ale. The Thunderers turned too. At first all he could see was the armored backs of the dwarves on the right side of the bridge, all surging closer to the rail. Then came another shout. 
on the left too. Then, the towers, the towers. Scarry snapped his head left and right, searching for the threat in the dim morning light. Over the heads of the dwarves to the left, he saw what looked like long black swords waving around, and he heard the grunts of dwarves in pain. Then movement from the towers drew his eyes and he looked up. Fat black shapes, with smaller shapes on their backs, were swarming up the sheer walls. Spiders! Spider riders! More spiders clambered over the sides of the bridge. Not black swords, thought Skari. Spider legs! They were surrounded. Grugni's beard! Swore a warrior behind him. They must have crawled along the underside. Skari drew his hand axe and turned towards the flanks with the others. Thunderers! called Auric. Stay to the front! Keep your eyes on the bridge! But it was impossible. The spider riders were amongst them now, stabbing with spears as their mounts whipped about with their legs. The thunderers had to turn and fight. Their next rank dissolved into a mad scrum as they joined the rest and faced the new menace. Axes chopped and hacked, cleaving goblin skulls and sending shattered spider limbs spinning. Auric and his hammerers fought at the left side of the bridge, cracking carapaces and crushing greenskins. A dwarf staggered past Skari, his face swollen and black from a poisoned bite. Blood hemorrhaged from his nose and ears. A thunderer fired point-blank at a spider leaping at him. The spider's head exploded and it collapsed in a clatter of legs, but its rider leapt at him thrusting at him with a spear. Skari hacked the goblin down, but it was too late. The thunderer fell back, the spear through the eye slot of his helmet. A shriek from above made Skari look up. A spider and goblin were falling from the tower, but the spider had a dwarf in its clutches, and he fell too, still fighting as they vanished into Skarenruff Gorge. The sound of furious battle echoed from the tower tops as the crews defended their guns. Skari returned his gaze to the battle. One of Oryx's hammerers was down, fighting to throw off a spider that pinned him to the ground. More spiders were climbing over the struggle to reach Oryx. Faint son, beware! Skari surged forward, the keg on his back lending him weight and momentum, but before he could reach Auric, he felt the bridge tremble under his feet. Something was shaking it. He looked towards the goblins, expecting to see another troll or some other horror. Instead, he saw cows. The herd, his herd, was stampeding across the bridge, their eyes rolling with terror as the whole horde of gibbering goblins poured after them like a green tide. Cows! He shouted. Stampede! Look out! All around him, dwarves looked up from their fights and stared. Auric turned and swore. Fall back! Fall back! Off the bridge! He cried. Skari could see it pained him to say it, but the faint sun was right. With the cannon crews and the thunderers fighting for their lives, there was nothing to stop the herd from trampling them to a pulp. The dwarves backed towards the end of the bridge, trying to extricate themselves from their fights. Skari heaved his ale keg at a spider rider and joined them, though he knew it would be useless. They weren't moving fast enough. The thunder of hooves was getting louder. The herd would close the distance in seconds. The spider riders screamed as they saw the wall of cow flesh bearing down on them. They broke away from the dwarves, shrilling curses and scuttling over the sides of the bridge. It seemed they hadn't been told of the herd's part in the attack. Free of their fights, the dwarves turned and ran. Skari wondered briefly if there was any dishonor in running from cows, but on the whole he thought not. It was no more cowardly than running from an avalanche. 
The first few dwarf warriors reached the end of the bridge and scattered left and right behind the towers. They were the lucky ones. The deafening ramble of a thousand hooves nearly shook Skari off his feet. Five paces from the end, he threw himself aside. A bellowing cow shouldered him into the stone rail, crushing his ribs and knocking him to the flags. Another stepped on his leg. He covered his head with his arms and curled in a ball as the herd rushed by inches away. Auric lay beside him, protected by his armor and the shields of two of his hammerers, who lay on top of him, heads lowered. One of them was knocked away by a maddened cow, and went rolling and bouncing into the stream of cattle, kicked and crushed along with a score of other overrun warriors. Skari leapt on the shield the hammerer had left behind, holding it in place over Auric. "'I have it, Fane's son!' he cried. "'Stay down!' His words were lost in a clattering roar of the herd's passage. Another cow kicked him in the shoulder as it leapt over him. Its back feet grazed his helm, tearing it from his head. And then the herd was passed, but there was no respite. The fading thunder of hooves was drowned by the shrill war cries of the goblins that swarmed in their wake. They enveloped the fallen dwarves like a flood tide, stabbing down at every one they passed. Skari squirmed aside from three goblin spears and lashed out with his axe, fanning his attacker's back. His ribs screamed, his arms and legs throbbed, his ears rang, but there was no time for pain. Giving into it meant death. Auric lurched up beside him, roaring and bleeding into his beard from a gash on his cheek, as he swept out with his shield and smashed Skari's goblins to the ground. His remaining hammerer stood beside him and guarded his left flank. Skari instinctively snatched up the other hammerer's shield and guarded his right. A dozen goblins thrust their spears at them, howling for dwarf blood. "'Close up!' shouted Auric to the few survivors who picked themselves up by the edges of the bridge. "'Close up between the towers!' He cleaved the goblin's skull with grudgeander and kicked it away, then started cutting his way to the end of the bridge. "'Come on, young cowherd,' he said. "'It seems you get to fight after all.' Skari's heart swelled at the words, and he followed, hacking around him with his hand-axe. He was protecting his fane's son, doing a hammerer's job, in the most brutal battle of his life. This was an end to be proud of. This was a death to brag of in the halls of the ancestors. The dwarves on the bridge rallied around Auric and inched towards the space between the two towers. The dwarves that had escaped the stampede regrouped and pushed onto the bridge again to join them. They were entirely surrounded by goblins, Though most of the greenskins were still scampering across the bridge, those who had run with the herd had already reached the dwarf side, and were turning back to attack the dwarfs from the rear. "'Form a square!' called Auric. "'All face out!' The dwarfs, drilled in defensive tactics from birth, fell easily into ranks and files, and plucked the end of the bridge, facing out both front and back. The tide of goblins stopped, though dwarves died fighting them all along the edges of the square, which was quickly growing hollow, as the warriors in the center pushed to the edges to replace the fallen. Skari found himself fighting next to Old Harn, who swung an axe in one hand and a bucket of hot pitch in the other. "'It won't last,' the stretcher-bearer muttered as he fought. "'We'll never hold them. There are too many. Then we shall thin their ranks before we die, said Skari, beheading a goblin, and send them on to feign Thunderbrand, a shadow of their former selves. Harn grinned wryly. Read a few sagas, have you? Uh, 
A few. Scarry smiled sheepishly. A horn sounded in the distance, barely audible over the din of battle. Oryx's head lifted. The reinforcements! Saved, said Scarry, knocking aside the goblin spear with his shield. No, said Oryx. They must not come. They would only join us in death, and to no purpose. They must go back to the hold and protect it. He turned to his last remaining hammerer. Gurgrin, your horn, acknowledge their call. Then blow, fall back and defend, enemy coming. The hammerer unslung his horn stoically, though he knew that he blew his own death song. Scarry swallowed as the sharp notes blared out over the melee. A musical version of the rat a tat of the old dwarf mine code. That was it then. They had sealed their fate. He wasn't frightened, but it was one thing to imagine one's glorious death. It is another to know it is a certainty. Far off, the reinforcement's horn answered Gurgrin's blast, querying it uncertainly. The hammerer raised his horn to his lips again and repeated the orders. Fall back and defend. Enemy coming. Fall back and defend. Enemy coming. The notes cut off with a squawk, and Scarry turned to see Gurgrin toppling sideways, his helmet caved in by a cannonball. Scarry stared, shocked. Where had it come from? He had heard no shot. Gurgrin! cried Auric. Another ball smashed down on old Harn, shattering his shoulders and knocking him to the ground. Scarry and Auric and the others looked up. The spider riders on the tower tops had won their fights. They stood on the battlements, hurling cannonballs down into the battle and shrieking with glee. Scarry and the others raised their shields as iron balls rained down on top of them. They thudded off the heavy wood in a crushing barrage, nearly driving the dwarves to the ground. Scarry staggered as his arm failed and his shield cracked him on the head. The goblins before them took advantage of their awkward position and stabbed at their bellies. Scarry brought his shield down on three spears and swung his axe over the top, cracking a knobby skull. Auric, too, blocked three spears, but a fourth got through. A goblin stabbed him in the neck, just above his Gromril breastplate, and the spear had vanished into his magnificent beard. He staggered back, choking. Auric! gasped Scarry, and shoved forward to protect his leader, but a cannonball glancing off another dwarf's shield struck him on the side of the skull and suddenly he found himself lying on his back with no memory of falling. He stared up at Auric as the faint sun dropped Grajander to clutch at his now crimson beard, and a dozen goblins leapt on him with spears and daggers and bore him to the ground. Then there was nothing above Skari but sky, which strangely was getting darker, though the morning sun was at last rising above the peaks.